It's been a really productive and interesting day so far, so I hope this final one will be of interest. Um, the title of our panel um, is uh, Creating Global Citizens for the 21st Century. And um, initially, uh, uh, we, it started, we had originally had sort of something that sounded similar to the first panel. And what I wanted to emphasize uh, in this afternoon panel was the importance of uh, simultaneously amplifying both global complexity and local contexts in the academic preparation of our students. Um, so bear with me for a few minutes. I'm just going to wake us up a little bit and give our first speaker a bit of a chance to <laughs> catch his breath. Um, so, uh, and I'm going <laughs> to, the awkward, okay, whoops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> I was going to do something more exciting than that, but um, so we, uh, of course, the world is not flat, and, and Thomas Friedman has caught a lot of flack for saying that and making that claim. Um, and we teach, uh, and the world is made up of nations, but nations isn't just what our world is about. Um, it's round, um, but is it organized or is it teetering on collapse? And this is one of the challenges in uh, teaching contemporary students about, um, about the world is it can seem incredibly daunting to them. And figuring out how to give them how to help them understand that complexity and understand how complexity reverberates in local contexts and how local experiences create also shape that global complexity is, is a mind-bending trip for most students. And what we need to do is figure out how to give them the skills that help them navigate. Um, the world is networked and interdependent. It's complicated and it's uncertain. Uh, and there's a proliferation of stakeholders, and I've seen this proliferation of stakeholders really quite dr grow dramatically in the last 25 years. And what I mean by that is we're not just tech talking about national leaders uh, shaping the world. We're talking about transnational organizations, social movements, uh, social grassroots movements, and we're also talking about corporations that are really finding not a lot of support and governance in, in, in your usual realms and having to make, make do in the field of cybersecurity, for example, um, and try to make policy on their own and on the wing. And we have some very critical global challenges. So how do we prepare students? And I would argue what we need to be doing is preparing students to be culturally competent collaborator in any sector of the economy, not just government. Governments are shrinking mostly around the world. Um, and governance is taking place not only in, in uh, what we would think of as intergovernmental organizations and multilateral organizations, but governance is taking place in many other places besides the usual ones. And we need students to be nimble, creative, critical, and systemic analysts. Uh, not, and they need to understand systems and the complexity of systems. And at, finally, as I said at the beginning, they need to be a simultaneous assessor of both global complexity and local context. So um, we have three distinguished panelists today um, we'll be, who will be talking about um, bringing to bear some very important insights, both from the perspective of a long history of international affairs and international policy, international affairs training, uh, uh, several who talk about new curricular programs that are problem focused, um, and uh, representatives talking about setting new policy priorities for international education investment. Um, our first speaker, I'm going to introduce all of our speakers, and then they're going to just get up and, and make their talks as we go. I think that will save us time. Our first speaker is uh, Professor John Keeler, who's the Dean of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. He was previously the president um, of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs from 2010 to 2011, and the chair of the European Union Studies Association. Our second speaker will be uh, Professor Vince Gallucci. He's the director of the Canadian Studies Center at the University of Washington and serves as a Wakefield Professor of Ocean and Fishery Sciences in the College of the Environment. He is also uh, bridges out to the policy world um, and is a member of the Arctic Council, appointed as Ar on the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment Team. 
and he'll be talking about our new Arctic Studies program. Uh, we have uh, Maureen McLaughlin, who is a senior advisor to the Secretary of Education and Director of International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Education, and she has been leading and coordinating the department's international activities and engagement since August 2010. And finally, we'll have uh, Jennifer Butdahl, who is our, the director of the Jackson School of International Studies, new Master of Arts in Applied International Studies, which will be launched this fall. She has lived and worked on five continents and engaged on critical global challenges from many vantage points. She brings a wealth of experience from many sectors in the U.S. government, nonprofit, and business. And, um, and given the challenge of building this new program, she's one of the best team builders I've ever seen. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce John Keeler. Okay, and she's got uh, yeah. <clears throat> you want it? Yeah, I was introduced as the dean of Graduate School of Public International Affairs at Pitt, what we call GISPIA. That's true, but I should say I'm implicated in much that the University of Washington does on, <laughs> on and smiling, because I spent 27 years at the University of Washington. Uh, Don Hellman was acting chair of political science in 1980 when I arrived as a very young guy. Rashad Kassaba was four years old then, I think. Anyway, <laughs> so I go back a long way with many of these people. Um, <clears throat> you'll note that the conference asks us to focus on the future direction of international affairs education and foreign language studies in the United States. And our panel is supposed to be looking at training the next generation of international affairs experts, and I assume that means within the United States. So I'm going to diverge from that template in two ways. One is <clears throat> I'm going to talk perforce a little bit about the global as well as national perspective on training uh, for international affairs, and I'm also going to give it a historical <coughs> dimension because I think that's really important in understanding where we're going. We have to see where we've been. <clears throat> so <clears throat> just a little bit on changes in the landscape of international affairs education. <clears throat> what this chart shows is the proliferation of schools of international affairs in the U.S. and abroad. This is data from APSIA <clears throat> and it tracks the number of member schools. So the green line on the top shows the total number of um, uh, members and affiliates of APSIA over time. <clears throat> and you can see from the bottom uh, line that the growth recently has been disproportionately abroad. Uh, but again, the total moves up and each of the other lines, the U.S. and international line, move up. So <clears throat> since 1988, there's been simply a very large increase in the number of schools, both nationally and internationally, uh, claiming, at least, to do a good job of training people for international affairs. Within the United States, <clears throat> this has happened from two different angles. <clears throat> On the first side, there's been a retooling of U.S. policy schools that traditionally focused a bit more, at least, on national, even state issues. <clears throat> so the Maxwell School has uh, added a substantial new international dimension, not by accident, recently hired the former number two person in the State Department, Jim Steinberg, as their dean. The LBJ School of Texas <clears throat> launched a new Master of Global Policy Studies program, and their last two deans have been uh, ambassadors. The Sanford School of Duke added a, devel a uh, development policy program. Humphrey School at Minnesota did the same thing, and we'll come back to the broader context of that expansion of policy of uh, development programs. <clears throat> I'm going to skip a couple of these, given our time constraints. <clears throat> On the other hand, there's been a creation of new U.S. policy schools with an international focus uh, full stop. So we have everything from UC San Diego's program <clears throat> in 86 through Georgia, Texas A&M. Bush School didn't exist until 97. It's grown into quite an uh, important school. Seton Hall, George Mason, Florida International, Virginia, Penn State, um, and I've left many others out. And as Harry Harding at the um, Virginia program, the Batten School said, you know, policies everywhere in a globalized world, we don't have to go on with a quote. Um, on many campuses <clears throat> that did not have international affairs programs, uh, presidents or provosts of the last 20 years have had meetings and said, oh no, we don't have one of those schools. Uh, it's the symbol of globalization on many campuses. We have to have one. 
And that's what I've heard, at any rate, it is, is, has been a major factor in leading to that expansion. <clears throat> has also been perceived to be a growing market for those graduates, although at APSIA Dean's meetings, we used to have a lot of discussions of what they were reading we weren't reading, since it wasn't necessarily the case that the number of jobs were growing proportionally to the number of new policy schools. Um, but at the same time, there's been a huge growth <clears throat> in important policy schools around the world. I'm obviously not going to go through all of these, but just to give you one example, um, <clears throat> in Korea, where which used to send a tremendous number of students to our schools. In Korea, since 87, all three of the Sky universities, the most prestigious universities, have launched programs like this, all of which are top quality now, and which keep a lot of those Korean students at home. <clears throat> uh, we could go way down the list. I'm going to save time by skipping, but I'll just say one huge factor here that we'll come back to is increasingly in these cases with um, Singapore perhaps being the best example, um, instruction is either exclusively or largely in English. It's designed in cases like Lee Kwan School in Singapore to allow them to bring in students from elsewhere in Asia who can use this lingua franca, but it also raises big questions about our traditional relationship with these schools abroad. I'll come back to that too. Um, <laughs> as someone who began his career as a specialist on French politics and French policy, I can say I really knew the world had changed when in Paris, where not long ago it was illegal to have a website in English, <laughs> Sciences Po, the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris, launched an English language school. <laughs> it's called the Paris School of International Affairs. That's not a translation. That's what they call it on their website. Instructions in English, and it's pretty remarkable. And then we have <clears throat> you know, the dog that didn't bark for a long time. Uh, where was the Oxford Policy School? Uh, well, they realized that people were going into LSE, and gosh, we should have one. And I'm just going to give you two points on this. You know, Oxford woke up, and when a Russian oligarch decided to give them a lot of money, they decided now was the time to launch this program. Um, you'll notice that Lord Patton, Chancellor of Oxford at the time, said, this is a once-in-a-century opportunity for Oxford. Through the Blavatnik benefaction, Oxford will now become the world's leading center for the training of future leaders in government and public policy. So all of us can just pack up our bags and go home. Oxford's taken over. And this is an extended quote. The university has educated 26 British prime ministers and over 30 other world leaders. Yet until now, the major international schools of government have all been outside of Europe, principally in the US. The Blavatnik school will correct that imbalance. So we're waiting to see exactly how that plays out. But that sums up pretty well how the landscape has changed. You know, Oxford woke up and said, oh my god, we missed this trend. They even had to invent English language programs in France. And all across Asia, um, they're emulating APSIA schools in, in a way that's had profound effects. <clears throat> this has led to, among other things, a proliferation of global international affairs school partnerships. Uh, some of them are very ambitious multilateral partnerships. Then there are dozens and dozens of bilateral partnerships. I'll just be quick on this. There was the high visibility launch of the <coughs> Global Masters in Development Practice program with funding from MacArthur. Maybe we'll hear some reflections on that later. Uh, <coughs> it funded five US and 15 international universities to do a uh, Masters of Development Practice. There's the Global Public Policy Network with a lot of high profile partners trying to collaborate on a whole host of issues. There are things like the Transatlantic Master's Program, which I was involved in indirectly when I was at the University of Washington. Um, so a whole host of these very ambitious multilateral programs. And then there are bilateral programs, uh, principally of three types at least, that have increased a lot over time at most APSIA schools. Um, dual degree programs are the most ambitious thing in this group. You have high profile programs like <coughs> the SIPA Columbia program with Sciences Po in Paris. Um, <clears throat> at my school, uh, the most popular of the dual degree programs is with um, the IOMBA program, International Organizations MBA, pro MBA program in Geneva. We have Kobe University Graduate School of International Cooperation Studies. Semester exchanges, <clears throat> we now have these with 10 universities abroad, uh, most recently with Los Andes in uh, Colombia and with Witzvatersrund in Africa. These are just examples. Internships and summer programs. 
We have a very popular uh, program in Brussels now in the summer, in a program I launched when I was at the University of Washington directing the <laughs> European Union Center. But again, all of our APSIA schools and other schools have many of these programs. So the point here is that when we talk about training our students in the U.S. for the future, <clears throat> it's taking place in this context where we have a lot more global partnerships, there's a lot more movement of our students abroad, if not for uh, a full year or two years for a dual degree program than for at least uh, a summer of formal training or often a semester. So this leads then to preparing the next generation. And <clears throat> as I said, I was supposed to talk about the future, so I'll begin, like any academic, by talking about the past. Um, I thought it'd be useful to look at <clears throat> what in APSIA circles, at least, is a famous go-to document, the 1987 Goheen Report, written by a former president of Princeton, who was asked to look at the curriculum of the APSIA schools at that time <clears throat> and give a critique and some recommendations. I found it very interesting to look over Goheen in the context of the topic for today because we'll start with this. He discussed what he called the three aspects of APSIA pedagogy. So this is in 1987. First, a commitment to an interdisciplinary curriculum, political science, economics, other social sciences, history, statistics, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, Jim Goldgeier talked about the very expansive set of disparate faculty they have at AU, which is one of the largest programs, and maybe the largest when you take in the undergraduates, they have too. Uh, but everywhere um, in 87, they were debating what the right mix was, and we still debate this. <laughs> I'll come back to that too. And it's interesting, uh, Goheen's critique of APSIA pedagogy was, it was called interdisciplinary, but he said it was too often just multidisciplinary. The students were left to make the connections. Um, who was it who gave the example of a course in which the anthropologist and the economist alternate, and the students are left to figure this out? We all still have that problem. It hasn't gotten any easier. Um, Joel Migdal and I years, to, years ago had a grant for a program that we called Bridging the Gap, looking at questions like this, and we found that we brought in interdisciplinary scholars who largely talked past each other. Um, I'd like to say it's all changed now, but not entirely. Um, <clears throat> Goheen noticed, too, the tension between theory and application, uh, which was embodied by the use of both disciplinary PhDs and practitioners. Of course, many of the practitioners also have PhDs, certainly the ones that are on in tenure lines, <clears throat> but we still face this. There's no easy answer, and I've talked to enough deans at other APSIA schools that we notice a, a troubling trend toward student comments at the end of a term saying, why do we have those tenured faculty who talk about theory? We just, we thought we were gonna get skills. We just want, we want more practitioners. Let's just talk about how best to pack your bags for the next trip to Moscow, you know. Anyway, we don't, we don't need to talk about hegemonic theory in international political economy. So we haven't really transcended that either. John, Finally, four yeah. Four minutes. Yeah. On instructional methods, <clears throat> Goheen noted that traditional lectures and seminars were the rule, but that was now challenged by the business school model. The Pew Initiative had provided money to look at case studies and also simulations, role playing. Um, <clears throat> that's one area where there has been some change. Um, the case studies didn't become the rule, even though they're, they're largely used. I think partly because of the force of technology, there's, there's more uh, experimentation with new instructional methods now. Quickly on his recommendations, he said, every IA master's graduate should have expertise in a foreign region and its language. I'll come back to that. He said, APSIA schools should really consider adding a third year of instruction, because two years wasn't enough. Everybody ignored that. As he said, they probably would. And instruction should increasingly involve more action participation, especially case studies involving role playing. So how has the curriculum changed since then? Um, this may be a bit controversial given what we've heard today, but I think it's fair to say there's been somewhat of a reduced emphasis on the regional slash language expertise, partly a function of the fact that English has grown as a lingua franca, and then especially the enhanced emph emphasis on expertise and economics and quantitative methods at a, a large number of our schools. There has been more of an embrace of the participatory, participatory instructional techniques. <clears throat> In recent years, it's been driven by technology too, so we have students at our school using Palantir and Analyst Notebook software to analyze uh, 
uh, network flows for intelligence and security. Um, finally, I think things have changed in that there's a larger menu of specializations in the post-Cold War world, and I'll come back to some reasons for that. And it really takes us into these two things. So this is my favorite slide in the whole mix. And I think all the women need to give a round of applause at the end of this. Issues Goheen could not have foreseen. Number one, the new gender imbalance. In 86, only 39% of students in APSIA schools were women. Only one school had 50%, exactly, and five had under 40%. And I just want to stress, Goheen did not note this as a problem. He saw nothing problematic with this. He probably thought it was inevitable. He said, uh, you'll be shocked, we need to recruit more minorities, but he didn't say we need to recruit more women. <clears throat> in 2012, 56% of students in APSIA schools were women. 16 of 19 APSIA schools that reported data had a majority of women, and six enrolled 61 to 70% women. Now, how do you explain this? Really quickly, you know, we, most of you in the room know this, women now represent two-thirds of the U.S. students to study abroad. They also represent 60% of the Peace Corps volunteers. <clears throat> and as the father of both a daughter who graduated from college last year and a son who's a sophomore in high school, I know all the reasons for this. <laughs> You've heard about it. Some colleges have affirmative action for men. <laughs> the women outperform the men on both the standardized tests and grades. They're just better, more serious students. My wife says, well, they listen, but I won't go into that. <laughs> um, at any rate, <clears throat> this is a fascinating issue. There's a 44% increase in the, in the percentage of women in our student bodies now. It has absolutely been important. It's helped to drive all kinds of uh, debates, and I'll come back to that in one sec. The Goheen couldn't foresee it. Number two is the changing mix of international students. <clears throat> and you know where I'm going with this. Chinese students are now the number one source of international applicants at most APSIA schools. At some, they represent more than 50% <coughs> of international applicants. With the recent decline over the last few years in U.S. applicants, the international component's grown at many schools, and it leads to new pedagogical challenges from <coughs> language to cultural accommodation, issues of course content. If you go back to the early 60s when many of the first APSIA schools were already functioning, we were still the beacon of democracy, taking the poor unwashed international students in and teaching them how Congress worked. Where's, where's our congressional special? We know it works differently now, but we have real challenges now in pedagogy for this reason. And here I am, last slide. Um, <clears throat> just general conclusions for people to reflect on. Many curricular debates remain as they were in 87, as I said, theory versus practice, finding the proper interdisciplinary mix, uh, figuring out ways to claim that it's more than a cacophony of different disciplinary specialists. That problem's gotten worse. Um, <clears throat> but the new slash future curriculum is now more heavily influenced by global collaboration, often in English, by the quantitative turn. There had already been one before in 87, but we know it's much more uh, substantial now um, and more general than economics being more quantitatively driven. And new technologies from analytical software to video linkages, online programs. And that last point, I think, is really important to address. The curriculum is now shaped, in part, by the 44% increase in women students over the last 27 years, the new international student profile, and <clears throat> the complex post-Cold War, post-9-11 uh, situation where we have many new specializations from human security to terrorism, counterterrorism, to transnational organized crime, to we could go on forever, big data. Um, but just one last point on the women students. Um, I haven't done a scientific study of this, but I can say based on my school and having looked casually at many others, it really is important. Many of my faculty talk about our Save the World students. These are students who are really driven to make a difference. <clears throat> yes, they want to be grounded and they become grounded, but I will say this, proud father of a daughter who graduated last year, a disproportionate percentage of them are the women they're the ones who dream of running a refugee camp in Rwanda. Um, <clears throat> they're the ones, you saw, 60% of the Peace Corps, who are more interested in development. Two-thirds of our development students are women. Um, and it helps they know languages. Since the men either don't take them or don't do as well, that also gives them options to do some things like that and pushes them to drive for different kinds of specializations, programs, et cetera. So 
I'll leave that there. Thanks, John. Okay. And this gets you teed up. Before I really say anything, funny or not, um, I want to thank um, the leadership, in particular Rasat, for uh, this opportunity to be here. It's a rare opportunity to be um, on the same program as my brother. Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a great honor for me, but, but I, and I don't know how he feels. But, uh, <laughs> Um, but I really do appreciate the offer and, and, and this opportunity. You know how you can go to a meeting and um, you, you hope that every, at every meeting you go to, you'll learn something and that you wa a walk away message. I can tell you my walk away message. Never be on the same program as my brother. No way can I match. So. I ask for your forgiveness to start with. <laughs> I also need to tell you um, uh, that while I am the director of the Canadian Studies Program, I have a, uh, a co-director or a sub-director, whatever the right word is, and, and I have to ask you, those with glasses, you ought to clean them because you can't see, but Nadine Fabi is really standing right here. <laughs> And so the presentation uh, is, um, is a, a, a joint effort, and um, as of as late as 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so I have to say, I haven't seen some of the slides. But, <laughs> but okay. Um, oh, that's the wrong note. So... I really have three points I would like to make, and one could argue I have no right to have an opinion because I've only been in the Jackson School for maybe going on two years, but I did have some observations that I think coming from the outside because all of my formal training, except as an undergraduate minor and I took political science, but I was a physics major and none of the other physics majors took political science as a minor. Uh, it would have been, uh, I mean, it would have, uh, should have been astronomy or mathematics or something like that. But I had an early contamination, I guess, and, and that's the way it is. Um, but otherwise, all of my formal training is in the sciences. My beginning degrees are in physics and statistics, uh, and then later degrees, uh, I mean, later work in biology and oceanography. But I evolved into the direction of ocean policy, which then led to this natural collaboration in, uh, in the Jackson School. So I have three points that I'd like to make. One is to discuss this conceptualization of foreign affairs into area studies in foreign language. The second one, very quickly, is to talk, to talk about uh, the Arctic, as you've heard a little bit about this, and I want to say a few words about the Arctic, as you might guess, I might have an opinion, uh, uh, and, and both within JSIS and outside of JSIS, the Jackson School of International Studies, and Title VI. And the last is to, oh, could you hand me that, please? <laughs> this? Yeah, I didn't stage that, um, was to talk about um, the uh, University of Washington, in particular, the Arctic program to global citizenship and global citizens. Um, let's take, just as an orientation, let's take, all right, look at this. I think I asked my brother, I don't know, maybe days, weeks ago, why is it, the, my observation is that when I began to talk about the Arctic with Rissat, and the associate director, he was astoundingly receptive, and I, and I, and I expect I didn't expect that, frankly. I thought I'd get a better receptivity amongst my scientific colleagues in both in the marine biology area and in, and in oceanography, but I didn't. And I was asking, 
my brother, why did he think that the people who were in the social, political, international affairs were, were receptive? And what, he's, what he said, I, he may want to disown this now, but what I swear, this is what he said. It's my left hand, but that's the way it is. Um, what he said was that because there are areas of ambiguity and they have something to do with global, that they would be more interesting to, um, to people in international affairs. And so I, that caused me, I don't know, I don't remember whether I ha ever had told him about this, but there is, in this central area of the, we see this is the Arctic Ocean, so now you're looking on the globe from the top. So there is, everything is south in this one, right? Um, and so you're looking at, at the Arctic Ocean, and this white section is it's about the size of the Mediterranean Sea. And this white section belongs to everyone. It's a common property resource. And so when now it's interesting about this because all of these areas this are belong under the US um, under the law of the sea, uh, belong to the um, nation states that you see along here. But the situation is that this is open territory. And now you think about the recent admission of the Asian countries to, um, to, the Ar to the Arctic Council, and therefore this for them uh, will be an area that is open area. And if they, will, if they wanted to, they would have as much rights to do anything in that area as does Canada or Russia. So that open area, Bob, that's your fault that that's there up on the screen. And it is interesting to see that there, this is also shows the open area, but it is also, we call it the donut hole, because this is the hole in the donut, and this is the tissue that goes, or the, the dough that goes around it. Anyway, you can see the, the nations, and so there's five nations that own land around this, but there are a total of eight nations that own, that are inside the Arctic Circle. But it, you know, it's Russia is the biggest landmass, Canada is next, the United States is smaller, smallest. And this will come, we'll, so we'll leave this up, it's about Canada alone. So there is this conceptualization into area studies, um, and I'm interested in how this will evolve into the 20, how management of this Arctic environment will evolve in the 21st century. First of all, it doesn't fall into the category of one of the, um, of one of the Arctic um, nations. It, it's the whole, it's the all of the nations. What I want to say is uh, it, it's not one of the traditional, as you guess, um, uh, area studies. But when I first talked to Rasad, I said, you know, you look at all of these area studies, and each one of them is almost like a silo in a cornfield. There's interaction but it's, a, it's minimal. What's different, if we were to call this, this, this area, not this area, but the preceding one, if we were to call this a, a version of an area, an area studies context, we'd say, well, look, it, has, it encompasses several of the other traditional area studies programs in the Jackson School. It has the Russian Studies Center, it has the Canadian Studies Center. It has the West European uh, and uh, EU community, commu uh, study centers. So it is a synthesis of the traditional area studies program. It's quite different. And as we, m this is representative, I think, as we move in to the 21st century, that the world is no longer, I believe, going to be as neatly compartmentalized as it has been we, or the, at least the people who come after us, are going to have to learn to deal with these blurry boundaries. The reason, I'll jump right ahead on that theme, the reason this slide is here is to say, using Canada as the model, that here you see all, several, or you see all of the new territories that Canada has, has carved up, that Canadians, indigenous Canadian people have carved up to make new territories, Canadian territories. 
but they have been ceded the rights to almost everything except to declare war. Uh, they have an amazing amount of autonomy, and they're amazingly wealthy, and they are amazingly in danger. I want to be sure that this whole meeting didn't go by without someone talking about climate change, so I'm doing it. Um, and that's, if, any, if anyone in the world is going to be affected by climate change, it's the folks who live up there. Yeah, we're not even talking about a million people. Um, and so you're looking here at something that is representative of what is happening all over the world. In, indigenous people are making their marks. Now sometimes it's like it is in Rwanda, but sometimes it's like it is in Canada. So these, this, these, the Canadian North inside the Arctic Circle has gone through, they call the process, it's called devolution, it is devolving. <laughs> um, one ownership to, to ownership of um, uh, five different indigenous territories. No one was shot in this whole process. I mean, there wasn't a single rifle bullet shot to get this, and, and they this has been accomplished. I think we're going to see a world, now going back to something I said before, with many less boundaries. My God, time flies. <laughs> Five minutes. <coughs> so um, in any event, if I'm looking at the 21st century, and if I'm talking about education, do learn by what's happening, because I think it's only going to be amplified for the people who deal with the world as that is. Um, so I would, I would, uh, I would add that um, besides the, the role that the, the, the indigenous people have played, they also are a Canadian Inuit person. Some people still call them Eskimos, but nevertheless is going to be the chair for the next two years of the Arctic Council, and she's already made her mark. Um, the, so indigenous people around the world. I mean, how many people have heard about the UN Charter for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Amazingly important. The United States has been brought up on charges because we, we contribute, uh, what is it, 28% of the world's pollution, and we have 5% of the pe world's people or something like this, and therefore the, we, we should be sued for that. But things like that are likely to become more and more common. Now I just want to say my closing words are going to talk about what are we at the University of Washington, and in particular, the Jackson School doing for the 21st century education production of people who are widely and broadly educated. Let me say, you've heard about this Arctic Miner. It was, it was conceived by us, um, and it is truly interdisciplinary. Not interdisciplinary, like, for example, between economics and, and political science, but interdisciplinary between oceanography and marine biology and the Jackson School. That's truly interdisciplinary. And it was not without the spillage of a certain amount of blood and guts to make it happen. But it did happen, and it is working. The course that Don Hellman and I are teaching, we were concerned that it would only have students from the Jackson School in it, but more than half of the students come from the School of Oceanography. So now we're going to be producing, um, so it's not only just globally educated people, oceanographers who are going to leave knowing something about political science, how, th how the uh, Arctic is administered, future problems of governance and sovereignty. Half a minute. <laughs> and, um, and so, and we're going to be producing students from the, from the, uh, from the Jackson School with a foreign policy orientation who will know something about the biology and the oceanography of the area that they're going to be talking about governing. Um, and so that's at the undergraduate level, and we are currently hatching plans to go to the graduate level to get graduate certificate. So we'll also be producing graduate students with these same orientations. 
And this means that we will have a considerable number of people every year, graduate and undergraduate, move through our program receiving an education that is broadly based, that is integrative, because you cannot look at the Arctic and not immediately think about all of the other countries around the world that, are, that contribute to it. And at the same time, you cannot help but think about global climate change and what we are doing to that environment and to the world. And for that, I thank you for your time. Thank oh, I, su I suppose I should do the rest of this just because they're sexy. Hold on, we'll just, this should get sexy. There we go. And it gets, oh, that's the, who cares about that? And, oh, come on, it better be there. There it is. That's one of our, so that represents the Inuktitut, the, the, uh, the uncommon foreign language spoken by the Inuit, and there is a beautiful print. And that's the website. <laughs> well, while my slides are getting <coughs> put up, let me say thank you very much to the University of Washington for including me in their group. Um, I am <laughs> the only person here without an affiliation to the University of Washington Sorry. on the panel and also the only person who's not at a higher education institution. So the moment I feel like a little bit like a fish out of water, and I'm gonna take a little bit different uh, bent in, in my presentation, but lots of parallels and lots of connections <coughs> to what was being <coughs> discussed here. Um, also, I am, the Secretary of Education has a statutory uh, position on the board of the Woodrow Wilson Center by um, the creation of, of the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I actually act as his representative for the board meetings, et cetera. So it's always interesting to be here at the Woodrow Wilson Center with other hats and, and be listening and participating in programs. So again, thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit. The, in the Department of Education, uh, a couple years ago, we created our first strategy for what we would do in the Department of Education mm -hmm. that was international and global. And I want to give a little bit of context for that and then focus on the piece that I think is relevant to today and, and describe why it is that we set down that path. And I think it really does <laughs> link into the kinds of conversations we just heard. Um, why an international focus? We're a domestic agency. We're a domestic education agency. Why do, should we have a strategy for international engagement? And the first is economic competitiveness and jobs. Um, there's no question. Um, that jobs are more global, that people are competing across boundaries for jobs. Uh, there's also no question that uh, the ability to speak foreign languages is in fact a benefit for many kinds of jobs. And a recent survey uh, several years ago of 100 executives of big businesses said that in fact they were finding that foreign nationals uh, often had a leg up on the U.S. students because in fact they could speak a language and when they were hiring in other parts of the world that was uh, an added benefit that you didn't always get from U.S. students. Um, second is global challenges. So I'm number two to mention uh, climate change uh, because the, another reason is that <coughs> when we're out in the world and, are in, and working, we're all going to be dealing with issues that cut across boundaries, that cut across boundaries of, of countries, that cut across boundaries of, of different uh, areas of study. So it's really important that students go out into the world with the substantive knowledge in whatever field they're choosing, but also the ability to work with others uh, in other fields and in other countries and from other cultures as you work to solve uh, issues. The issues I frequently mention, first one is, oh, is usually climate change. Um, also, the issues related to the financial disasters uh, that we've had in, in recent years, um, setting up, running, and having Olympics. Uh, and um, in helping countries with national disasters, which we've unfortunately um, had too many of in, in recent years and even recent days, where countries do come together to work across boundaries. And then national security and diplomacy. And national security is broader than just people who are involved in national security per se, but how is it that we have a secure nation and what is it that we need? And there was a recent report, well, I guess it's not so recent now, but uh, in the last couple of years, a report done by the Council on Foreign Relations uh, that was co-chaired by Joel Klein, um, who headed the 
school system in New York City, or in New York, uh, and uh, Condoleezza Rice, the former Secretary of State, that they really looked at what is it that we need for people uh, coming out of schools, and, and they really emphasize that a strong, solid, high-quality education, global competencies, technological skills, the ability to innovate, uh, and knowledge of civics and languages was really an essential, not just for people who would go into national security and diplomacy, but for us to have a strong, vibrant um, country. And the last is we're a diverse society. So whether you leave the country or don't leave the country um, in, in your life, um, really you will be working with people, living with people, interacting with people from different cultures, from different religions, from different countries, from different backgrounds, people who were, have English as a first language, people who don't. And so that these to us, as we sat down to develop the strategy, were really the reasons that we thought it was essential for us to have a deliberate strategy about what we would do in, in international and global engagement. And as we did this, we also read um, a report that had been written um, for the, or published by the Woodrow Wilson Center called the National Strategic Narrative. And in this, two active military officers really looked at um, issues across, across the world and what was happening in terms of, of our engagement internationally. And one of the things that they said that very much affected us as we were putting together our strategy was that they felt to invest in more sustainable prosperity for the United States, we needed as a country to move more to the tools of education, to the tools of public engagement, and how to work with other countries, and how to engage with other countries, and how to do more of the people-to-people -people, uh, kinds of, of relationships, and less in defense. And so that really was here were two active military officers saying that the kinds of things that go on in education and the kinds of things that are important for public engagement are absolutely positively crucial um, for us uh, and every bit as crucial as what's happening in defense. So we developed a strategy, um, and we did it by internal and external consultation over a pretty long period of time. And again, it's a strategy for us as the U.S. Department of Education, not for the U.S. government, but it's what is the strategy for our engagement. And we have two main goals from our perspective. One is to strengthen U.S. education, and the second is to advance U.S. international priorities. We believe these are two interrelated goals, and then we have three objectives or three ways of, uh, that we feel we can contribute to those two goals. The first is to increase global competencies, and that we believe that um, <coughs> all students being globally competent is really essential, and I emphasize the all because it's not a luxury, it's something that we believe everybody, including more traditionally underrepresented groups, should have. A second is to learn from other countries about their education systems and what they're doing and how that might help us think about ways to improve or change or alter uh, what we're doing in the U.S. And in this learning from other countries, it is always a two-way conversation. That as we're learning from a country who may perform at a higher level than us on international assessments, they're usually also learning from us at, at the same time. And our third part is engaging in education diplomacy. And in this part, I really think of us in the U.S. Department of Education as more of a supporting partner um, to other agencies in the government, such as State Department or USAID or the multicultural, I mean multilateral organizations, where we're helping with the education capacity building or the technical assistance or the knowledge about education, as well as the sort of people-to-people -people and softer diplomacy. So, and the bottom one is uh, an internal one about how we do our business. But I'm going to talk today really <coughs> about the increasing global competencies because I felt as I got ready to speak today that this was the most relevant piece for the discussion we're having today. And I'm really apologize, but it looks like it's going to be hard for you to um, see this graphic. I'll talk you through it, and if you're interested, I'm sure the organizers would be happy to provide you the slides, or you can look at our website. So what does it mean to be globally competent? And I think uh, as we heard the discussions today, um, perhaps people didn't really use the word globally competent, but I think very much that that's part of what's there. And there's what I call broad global competencies and deep. And then in some ways I think the discussion here today was more on the very deep global competencies as people get into more and more specialized areas. But we're talking about the broad definition which would encompass the deep. Uh, and our, our, we spent time saying what does it mean and we convened a group and we looked, read lots of articles, et cetera. And we felt that we could spend a long time uh, coming up with the perfect definition. And in that case, uh, we 
might not have a strategy. Uh, so we really came down to a, a definition that had been developed by the Asia Society and the chief state school officers, which is encompassed in this graphic. Um, and, and I'll walk you through it since I apologize, you can't really read it. Um, we renamed it, and so um, we said it really was 21st century skills applied to the world. Um, and so we, we adopted the graphic, but we gave it a new title with their permission. And really what it is, is that um, there's, there, that people, well, let me step back another thing. We tried to say, how do we know how globally competent people are now? How will we judge whether or after we've had this strategy for a couple of years, whether people are any more globally competent than they are now? Unfortunately, there is no good benchmark data. There isn't even like a really solid, hard definition. There's little bits of data about different things, but no really good picture. So we don't have a baseline, so I guess we can't say that we've, what progress we've made in a certain sense mm -hmm. against a, a hard b baseline, but I think we'll be able to contribute and, and show different things that have happened. In addition, um, the OECD is in the process right now due to interest in countries like ours and other countries about this concept of global competency. They are now trying to see if they can develop an assessment for global competency that could be um, administered along with the PISA, the regular PISA international um, test of students at 15 to judge across countries. Can they develop a measure and can it be one that could be a be culturally uh, appropriate enough that it can be uh, implemented across countries. So they're just entering into the experimental kind of pilot stage for trying that. I think it's a very hard endeavor, but I'm thrilled that they're trying it and hoping that, uh, in fact, it will be, be helpful. But this global competency in the center of this graphic here is really something that's described as understanding the world through disciplinary and interdisciplinary study. And what I think of there is that's the core knowledge that people have. So the core knowledge if you're a, you know, a 15-year-old or a core knowledge if you're a graduate student or, or wherever you are in your uh, educational process, it's that core content knowledge that you have and that is hopefully at a, high, at a high level. And then around it are the skills and the dispositions about how you <coughs> use that information in a global context. So if you start at the left-hand purple one, um, it's really investigating the world. So can students look at the world you know, using this content knowledge, can they look at the world and investigate the world and investigate beyond issues beyond their immediate environment? And in doing that, can they recognize perspectives? Um, can they look at other perspectives, other approaches, other ways of looking at things than their own? And then after investigating the knowledge and being able to recognize other perspectives, can they communicate their ideas? Um, can they communicate what they've learned, what they see, what they see as the issues? And then fourth, can they take action? So, and so that to us is, is really the conceptually what we're thinking about when we talk about global competencies. So I mentioned to you there's no good baseline. So one thing that I think is very interesting, and I won't spend much time on it, is um, a new database that's available from the Asia Society called Mapping the Nation. And it takes, it's an online map that you can go online and do any kind of analysis you want with the data they have. It has a million data points uh, that links data on education, economics, and demographics related to uh, international trade, related to foreign language study, related to languages spoke at, spoken at home. And I think of it as a way, you, and you can look at this by state and then down to the county and really see kind of how global is your area. Um, and to me, it, it sort of links the demand and supply sides of, of the issue, uh, the demand from, the, from, the, from, from, for instance, the uh, private sector side, but then also uh, what, what people are taking, what languages, et cetera. The next is, is illustrative. I won't go into that either, but mm -hmm. for every, in addition to being able to go in and, and use the heat map and figure out what's happening in each state and each county, you, there are these infographics for each state that kind of summarize the picture. I picked this one out because I figured Maryland is, we're so almost in Maryland here, but I won't talk about it. <laughs> so, um, well, because I got the high five. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, another piece for us is the, is the studying of world languages. And there are enormous benefits of studying world languages, even in a world where the lingua franca is increasingly English. Um, there are still uh, substantial benefits, both from an educational point of view, a better understanding your own language, et cetera, but also in being able to deepen your knowledge of the culture and the environment and, and of, of other countries. Um, 
There is substantial federal support, um, although not as much as we'd like. Um, we in the Department of Education have a, an important piece, and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more later, um, but unfortunately smaller than we'd like if, if all else were equal. Defense Department, the State Department, the National Security Agency all have um, in, involvement in uh, languages in you. I don't know if you're going to talk a little bit about some of those things as you speak, but um, and, and different, some of it's concentrated on less commonly taught languages, some of it's broadening the base, there's many, many things there. Um, also, we see that there's encouraging signs in some states at the K-12 to level because that pipeline is so important for, for people to have uh, the ability to do deep study later is that pipeline. And we do see, for example, in Utah, Washington State, Kentucky, Delaware are some places that we see promising signs of, of increasing uh, study. I won't talk about this because I think this is a lot of what uh, other people on the panel have talked about, but I was really looking at the various aspects of what we think of as internationalization of U.S. campuses, and it is study abroad, it's international students on campus, it's joint and dual degrees, it's integration of the global aspects across the curricular, foreign language and area studies, and faculty exchange. And there's lots and lots of that happening, and I saw here earlier the um, Patty McGill-Peterson, who's the head of international for ACE. Patty, I guess is still there. And, and if you look, you can see lots of data about the different institutions around this country and the way they're global. Uh, I spent uh, an afternoon at the, at the University of Massachusetts at Boston um, a week ago, and I was floored at how um, incredibly global they have become since I you know, went to college and grew up in Boston many years ago. So let me just close by mentioning, I've um, been putting a little plug in for the Department of Education's uh, international and foreign language programs. Um, they're ones I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, they're really from our Title VI Act um, and from the Fulbright Hayes. These programs are up for competition again soon, and they're programs that are supporting competencies in, well, supporting uh, work in, in languages, in area studies. Um, and we're trying to broaden the impact of them so that the, the impact of these centers and of these programs are more than just where uh, the specific program is being funded, but that it's uh, broadening outreach to teachers or materials for teachers and, and things like that. But the competition for eight of these programs is being held this year. Again, I suspect some of you already know that. And um, we expect the announcements to be out by the end of May. Uh, these programs are run by the Office of Post-Secondary Education, and I see a couple of the staff in the audience, so if you want to get more information, um, please see them. And they also asked if I'd make a bit of a plea, which is, we need you. Uh, so in doing these uh, competitions, we need panel reviewers, and we need people with expertise in uh, international education, um, in language specialization in area studies, et cetera, to be able to serve as uh, reviewers so that this peer review process is carried out in as careful and as professional a way as possible. So again, if you have some time that you could be a peer reviewer, you can do it online so it doesn't require coming to Washington. Please see the, the, the staff here who, who are here and um, we'd love to have you help us out. So in closing, um, you there's lots more information on all of what we do on our website. But I, I guess I come at it a little bit of a different perspective than the rest of the panel, but I think very much uh, what we're talking about is all um, in the service of how do you help um, Americans to be able to better understand the world, better appreciate the world, be better be able to operate uh, in a global context. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna stay seated, if not only because I have a puffy jacket on my legs, so <laughs> it's Arctic temperatures in here. Um, I also don't have a PowerPoint slide. I'm a child of the State Department. The Defense Department has, they own PowerPoint. We just talk. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Jackson School's uh, new Master of Arts in Applied International Studies degree. Uh, this is a 10-month intensive area studies based uh, international studies degree that's been designed for professionals. So practitioners uh, who are working in the worlds of diplomacy, in development, in security, and in business. Um, 
And when I say new, I really do mean new. I came on board, I think, six months ago. Uh, we started marketing in January. We took applications in April, and we're welcoming our first cohort in September. So we're definitely uh, building the plane while it's in the air. Uh, but before I get into kind of what makes the program unique and maybe interesting to this audience, I just want to reflect on the conversations that we've had today, and I think it really sets us up well for uh, this. Um, the, the things that have resonated with me, you know, I think we all recognize we're living in a changing world um, where we have increasing complexities and interconnections. We have a broadening cohort of stakeholders who are engaged in these challenges. Um, we have an awareness that area studies remains critical to preparing our leaders to deal in this uh, increasingly complex world, uh, but we have a decreasing funding situation. And so given that, um, Jackson School leaders uh, who came way before I even joined, uh, Anand and Rashad and others, uh, looked for practical ways of addressing these types of challenges, not just because they had a responsibility uh, to ensure that we continue to develop the type of leaders that this world requires, but also because there's a business opportunity there, and there is, um, there's a lot of, of want and desire for uh, practical programs that bridge this gap um, and can do so in an environment of decreasing resources. So uh, we have this new applied master's degree. And, the, and one of the origins of this really was uh, requests from uh, foreign governments, from the military, from business, for an uh, intensive, accelerated one-year program on the West Coast. Uh, so and I'll first say uh, a little bit about me. I'm, I don't come from the academy. Uh, nor the professoriate, a word I learned from Sadia this morning. Uh, although I do teach in a class for undergraduates on uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of foreign policy making um, in the Jackson School. But I come from a number of disciplines. I've, I think I've worked in every sector uh, over the course of my career. And so I'm really focused in on the intersections and the connections between sectors, uh, the connections and dynamics between regions. Uh, that I think are becoming increasingly important. The, the new Applied International Studies degree, uh, I would define it um, by th three key elements. Um, and because I'm a student of Bob Gallucci, I will number them. Uh, one is length, two is location, and three is content. Uh, first on length, uh, this, is a, this is a 10 month program. Uh, there are it's a September to July. Uh, it's focused on working professionals, both foreign and domestic, who either they can't take uh, more than a year off from their careers, they need a master's degree to move up or to better understand the world, uh, they need a broadened perspective. Uh, and so this opens up new, new audiences for us. Uh, there are less than a dozen one-year international studies programs uh, in the country. There are two uh, APSIA schools only on the West Coast, um, which takes me to number two, location, uh, and that is uh, in Seattle, obviously, and also within the broader Pacific Northwest region and on the Pacific Rim, which puts us in a strategic location. Uh, whether or not you believe in the Asia pivot or Asia rebalance, uh, I think it's undeniable that Asia is playing an increasingly important role in the world and will continue to do so. And we have, in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest, a long history uh, and strong relations with our Asian counterparts. We're also, uh, our home in the Pacific Northwest also gives us a very unique worldview. We're not here on the East Coast. We, we are not part of this. But we have uh, in Seattle a microcosm of this emerging stakeholder community uh, that's engaged in foreign affairs. We have a major port with strong relationships to Asia and beyond. 
We have a significant military presence uh, with the Army and the Air Force just south of Seattle, a major naval presence around the region, um, and others, uh, who are all charged with looking out toward the Pacific uh, and engaging in those treaty relationships that are so important to this country. We also have, as Rashad mentioned this morning, leading businesses um, on the global stage, Microsoft, Starbucks, Amazon, all of those that you know, and many pr that you probably don't, uh, a very engaged environmental community, uh, in, obviously innovation and technology, um, another more northern, more beautiful Silicon Valley, potentially, um, and leading foundations and nonprofits the Gates Foundation, PATH, um, experts in global health and other development issues. And, and so the, all of these links, this, the stakeholder community is, is unique and it also links directly into the content of the program, number three, uh, which I would say in a word, if, if I had to define it in a word, is relevant. If I had to define it in three words, it would be deep and broad, which I think a number of folks have used that phrase today, and, and that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, when I say relevant, I mean the curriculum is meant to answer the questions, what are the key regions and thematic issues of today that are facing policymakers, development specialists, security specialists, business leaders? What are they today, and what are they going to be tomorrow? In that vein, we're looking at non-traditional security challenges, such as water scarcity and cyber and health. Uh, we're looking at uh, the challenges posed, challenges and opportunities posed by the opening of the Arctic on trade, on uh, international governance structures, on the environment. Uh, we're looking at legal structures, international legal structures, in a time of um, transnational actors and all sorts of other um, kind of conflict um, that is not state-based. And what gives us the ability to do this? It's resources. Um, I think is if you were here this morning and you saw Sadia's slide of the way that the Jackson School is organized, we have faculty that come from uh, a large array of academic disciplines. Uh, we have area studies experts that span the globe. Uh, we have functional experts uh, as well who have specialties in, in key areas. Um, and we're able to then take that mix, a very interesting mix of faculty from the Jackson School and pair that with practitioners in the local community to provide uh, an experience for students that is, um, is really getting at kind of the key or the core needs uh, of today and allowing us to go as, as broad and as deep as we possibly can uh, in 10 months, <laughs> which is a challenge. Uh, I like to say, you know, area studies and regional experts are critical, as we've seen today. Um, but as w the way I think about it in relation to this program, you know, the higher you get, the broader your mandate. Um, and it's increasingly important for for leaders to understand not only uh, particular regions or areas, but the dynamics between regions, the dynamics between countries, um, and the way that various sectors are now playing in the international affairs space. Uh, and with that, uh, and for that reason, we're really looking at the intersections, the intersections between regions and the intersections between sectors, and that's where the multidisciplinary element of this program comes in um, and where our location becomes even more important. Um, we're blending this deep area studies with practical application, uh, and we're doing that by really tapping into the local community. Uh, we've built practitioners into the curriculum, uh, into the teaching, and also set up a civic council of uh, organizations, both businesses, uh, foundations, nonprofit organizations, the military from across Seattle uh, who bring their voices, bring their perspectives uh, into the classroom and, and engage with faculty to, um, to really provide different perspectives on an issue. So, um, you know, Boeing, Microsoft, Gates Foundation, 
Joint Base Lewis McCord um, are all engaged with us on this and excited about being able to participate uh, with the University of Washington and get more involved both with students and with faculty. So it's a great way of bridging that gap. And I think about this, just to put it into a tangible example, if you think about China, uh, the Jackson School has uh, amazing, brilliant China experts. Um, but in Seattle, if you have, if we put a panel together or a course together on China, uh, you can look at it, you can look at the dynamics within China and why decision makers make the decisions they do, the historical, the cultural, the other aspects that play into that. You bring in Microsoft and they're looking at China through a lens of cybersecurity, perhaps. Um, and this interesting role that they have vis-a-vis -vis China, the US, and others really on the forefront of our cybersecurity policy and how the business community is reacting um, to this challenge. And on the other side, you have the Gates Foundation, uh, which is actively partnering with China on African agricultural development. Um, all three at the same table, and you have a really interesting view of how the United States and more globally were engaging with China across um, multiple sectors, which I think is exciting. Um, and just speaking of the unique attributes of Seattle, I'd be remiss um, if I didn't remind you that uh, we're also surrounded by snow-capped mountains, and there's water in every view you can see. So in case anyone's looking for a one-year sabbatical, um, there will be a lot of reading, but uh, you know where we are. Uh, so I just, uh, I'll conclude there, and then we'll just go with Thank questions. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Jen. <clears throat> So we have exactly 10 minutes, so I will collect some questions and then we'll, um, so uh, in the black, yep. Hi, this has been great. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. My name is Meg Gardiner. I'm actually a professor of international and intercultural education at Florida um, International University and a former Wilson Fellow, so it's great to be back. I had two questions, one for Dean Keeler, and that was, as you were mentioning, the increase in uh, female students. I wondered if there was a kind of parity in the increase in female faculty members in your program as well, um, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about that. And then for uh, Maureen McLaughlin, it, I was really excited about your mentioning that the OECD is, is going to be working on uh, assessment for global competency. <coughs> and I could like to talk to you about it. I just met this morning with somebody who was uh, instrumental in the DSECO project, which was the defining and selecting of key competencies um, prior to kind of the ri big rise of PISA and is very involved in this key competency uh, idea. And, and I would also recommend, obviously, you know about Vivian Stewart and Darla Deardorff's work. I mean, it looked like the process model, actually. So I would love to hear more about that. Okay, I had one down the front. Yep. And I think the mic's coming. Hi, Rick Lotz by Indiana State University. Um, I was wondering if any of the panelists could speak to the issue of international students at American colleges and universities engaged in international studies. Um, we're looking at uh, trying to recruit more of them into our international studies program, and I'm wondering, do they present special problems? Do they offer special opportunities? Um, one more question. I think I had one in the back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the panel and to the Jackson School. I'm Kent Hughes here at the Wilson Center. Question for Mar Maureen McLaughlin. You talked about the K through 12 pipeline and how it's picking up one state or another. Most studies suggest the sooner you start on languages, the better. <coughs> Have you thought of picking your list of priority languages, six, seven, or eight, whatever it might be, and then offering support to a school system that would say, we'll start in kindergarten and have a program that goes right through high school? Um, I think I'm going to add one more question for Maureen as well. <laughs> um, a few years ago, we, um, I think back in 2000, 
nine, we were we worked with a collective effort of um, universities across the state to assess global competency and global competency competency training in in Washington State higher education institutions, including community colleges. And we presented our report to K-12 um, leadership and K-12 teachers, um, and and they said to us, uh, and we were suggesting that they try to d develop some global competency criteria, and they said, the only way we'll develop global criteria, competency criteria is if you tell us that you require that for admissions. And then, of course, the global competency requirement also is that there's a pull from these other multiple stakeholders who would hopefully have an interest in increasing global competency. So I'm wondering to what extent do we, where do we put our investment? Do we put it in here to push, push people up through with competencies or do we have a magnetic force that pulls more people in through particular strategic policy? Candace, do you want me to go first? Yeah. Okay, great questions. Um, so the, fir the, the last question first. I think it's like everything, it, there's the, the bottom up and the top down, I mean it's a combination and unfortunately there's really limited mo money and this re relates a little bit even to the, the other question, unfortunately there's far more limited resources at the federal level to, to work on these issues than um, we'd like. Uh, but. The map that I showed here that the Asia Society did where you can go and you can look at states and at counties and, and one went we had one presentation where people actually looked at the Seattle area specifically. I think if I were a local, like a local school board um, and you wanted to sit down and say, okay, so what do you see as businesses that are here or what do you see as potential businesses you'd like to have here or what are the defense industry, what does that mean for uh, languages at my schools? Um, does it mean I should concentrate on, you know, Chinese or should I concentrate on Arabic or should I, you know, I mean, the, so you'd have those conscious discussions about what, what are the things that you as an area would like to focus on because you can't do them all and, and um, in some areas you, you'd want to focus more on Spanish and in others you might be Chinese and you'll see this happening around the country at some level. But your question is, I think you need to work start earlier because that is when people are, are best able to l start learning the languages and maybe they're not afraid of it. So you need to have those opportunities earlier for people to have, have that as an option. At the same time, I think that if, if there's more of the pull at the top, then you'll get more people trying to do it. I see sometimes from my, myself, I've had people ask me and, and they've said, well, they didn't know if parents were as interested. What I see, and this is totally anecdotal, is that the parents are phenomenally interested in their kids having more opportunities to study languages and they would really, really like that. Now that's an anecdotal, but it's anecdotal enough that I think there's a lot of truth there. So the, bo the answer to your question I think is you have to have the, 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 the starting early and the top and pulling up. Uh, if you talk to people at the Defense Department or at, well particularly at the Defense Department, they would like us to be doing more on the, on the lower levels of languages because it would help them to have a bigger pool to choose from when it comes time to do the deeper and more serious expertise. Um, so there was a question, but maybe this could be followed up afterwards. It's about more about the OECD initiative yeah. on competencies. There's also a question to John about the parity of female faculty. <laughs> and then the third question was about how do you, how do you teach international students in international studies program or are there special challenges associated with that? If you and want, I'm not sure who that was directed if you to. Went, I'll just quickly say the OECD one. This is, at the, this is at the early stages and if you want to give me a card, I'd be happy to mm -hmm. kind of hook you in. You're right that um, what you mentioned as the sort of looking at skills and competencies was the early, early work done that en in essence led into the PISA international tests and that was pretty instrumental. Uh, OECD is at the very early stages. They just had a meeting of their PISA bo governing board in the last month. Um, and they'll start now trying to figure out what are the competencies, how might you test them, can you do it in a way that it's legitimate across countries, because that's another big issue. If it works, and that's an if, they would not implement and actually try t doing it with, with as part of the PISA test till 2018, so it's one of those kind of things that would take time. John, you want to take? Yeah, on the <laughs> issue of the women faculty, yeah, I'd like to say something on that. Um, <coughs> back in the olden days when I was at the University of Washington, 
You know, we used to be told by the dean when we were starting a hiring process and the chair would intervene and say, now remember, we, if it's possible, it would be nice to hire a woman here or something like that. You know, the truth is we don't need to do that anymore. And it's partly because of that theme that the women are outperforming the men in many cases and there are just a lot of terrific women candidates. It varies by specialty, but I'll give you three examples that you might find particularly interesting. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jennifer Murchasashvili, who I hired some years ago, um, is a specialist on Afghanistan, and I cite her quite often as a, the kind of role model that reminds you why you, you, you think about underrepresentation. She's a fantastic role model for the women students and others, but just especially for the women students. Talk about Dauntless. Two years ago, she spent <clears throat> a month in Kabul uh, doing research when she was six months pregnant. I didn't recommend it to her, but that's Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> In an area where you wouldn't expect necessarily to find many women specialists, we just hired a woman finishing her PhD at Princeton, Meredith Wolf, who's a specialist on global financial regulation and has an MBA and worked for two corporations before going in there. So again, in, in an area where it used to be very hard to find women specialists, we have one. Uh, also, especially in terms of relating to international students, <coughs> um, we hired a terrific economist, Sarah Lenardi, a few years ago, who, by the way, was the first faculty member I'd ever tried to recruit who had offer, uh, offers on three continents. She had offer at Fudan University in China, two in Europe, several others in the States. We were able to get her. Um, she's from um, Indonesia, from West Borneo, was an undergrad at Stanford, did a PhD at Caltech. So she embodies this kind of globalness that you'd like to see anyway. And uh, those are just three fantastically inspirational women. So, yeah, we've been... We've wanted to do it, but I will just say it's happened because of merit, too. They're impressive. Maybe I'll take the question on international studies students in international students in international studies programs. We actually have a very diverse program in our, in our global studies, in our global, undergraduate global studies program. And many of them come through our community college system, where, where we have a special arrangement between community colleges in terms of uh, teaching some of these prerequisite courses that get you into our major. And uh, what we find is that those students are either um, immigrant, first, gen first 1.5 immigrant generation or refugee settle resettlement, or they're international students who come to the community college first and then, then apply to, you know, establish some residency status and then apply to the University of Washington. And uh, they're very keen and capable of um, participating in our program, and they offer, they add tremendous richness to our, to our, you know, American U.S. raised, U.S. born students. Um, and in particular, <coughs> their heritage communities and their interest in particular issues, whether it has to do with human rights or development or working back in the countries that they came from. We currently have a student right now who uh, is just finishing up. She was raised in Burundi. She came and did her uh, undergrad at community college, and then she is now working with us um, on a project with a local nonprofit to recommend how to do measurement and evaluation, and she's going to go back to Burundi and work on um, measurement and evaluation issues in, in Burundian development. So uh, she's taken a, a long, circuitous path, but um, it's those kinds of students. We're getting quite a few of those kinds of students who have these very rich international backgrounds. Can I make one comment about international students? We, uh, it, it, it's perhaps a little bit less relevant here, but we find some of our very best, well-trained, quantitatively, quantitatively well-trained students are coming from abroad, coming from other countries. Um, they make up a disparate proportionate number of our teaching assistants in, in quantitative classes, whether it be calculus or statistics or differential equations. And um, so, so we, uh, we in, so now I'm actually talking about in my schizophrenic life, I'm talking about this, this other part where I work in the scientific area. And here in this, in this area, they are enormously valuable and make tremendous contributions to our scientific programs. And um, I think that this is looking at the university as a well-rounded entity. It's worthwhile looking at these STEM areas as well as looking at. Can I add something to that yep. quickly? Last comment, and then we'll wrap very, it up. Very quick, because um, it's really pretty inspirational. <clears throat> there are a lot of articles in the Chronicle. We have someone from the Chronicle in the audience. 
and other places talking about the challenges of bringing in international students, especially China. Yes, there are linguistic issues and such, but um, on the math side, <laughs> it's just a reminder of that issue we all know about, that the rest of the world's outperforming us in math instruction. I had a Chinese student come in to see me a couple years ago, and she said, uh, excuse me, Dean, but I uh, may ask a question. I've heard some of the American students talk about how uh, the math and statistics courses are, are challenging. She says, we, we find some almost remedial, you know. 770 was the average GRE score in math of our Chinese applicants mm -hmm. last time. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, is it, is, have they gamed it or something? They perform very well in that area. It's remarkable. Okay, well, thank you again to the Wilson Center and the Jackson School and the Jackson Foundation, and um, thank you all for sticking with us all day. Oh, good. good, good. <laughs> Let me tell you that, you know, most of our... Oh, thank you. Jennifer, I, I hadn't noticed it, but I loved it when you mentioned your puffy 